Good afternoon, everybody. And by my clock, that's 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I want to welcome you to this month's um, GITA, GITA webinar on diversity and women in geospatial. But before we get into that, I'd like to do a couple of shameless plugs for GITA. First off, I want to thank all of our members for being a part of GITA. For without you, we couldn't bring you this kind of content. And I encourage you to, to, to reach out to your fellow professionals and, and talk about GITA, GITA and encourage them to become members. And those of you that are listening that are not members, please check out GITA.org and see what all we can provide for you and consider becoming a member. Um, here, April 23rd and 24th, we have our, our Pacific Northwest GITA Conference in Washington State. Um, so a lot of good information out here, pnwgita.com, about that event for those of you that are interested. Also, because this conversation is really focusing, focusing on diversity and women in GIS, I want to point your attention to an issue position paper that GITA published. I think this was back in 2016, there's 2014. And please go in and read this document. This is a really interesting document. To get to that document, you can go to GITA.org, down here in the search features, search features, our site and learning center and search for diversity or issue position papers to bring all of those up. And now I want to introduce you to our speakers that I'm very excited about. We've got Dr. Sarah Battersby, who is the research manager at Tableau Software, and we've got Dr. Lakshmi Ramasubramanian, Manian, Ramasubramanian, sorry, Dr. Lakshmi. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really excited about what these two professionals are going to talk to you about. And with that, Sarah, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Drew. Let me see if I can get my screen shared successfully. Oh, yeah. So I've just made you the presenter, and we should be good to go. Okay. So I'm assuming the slides are showing up now. Yes, I've got you. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks for, for the introduction. I tell you uh, what, I, before you get started, I do need, I'm sorry, um, this, this is being recorded for all of, all of you that are listening. Um, this recording will be posted to GITA.org within a week or so. And also, please, we're going to try and hold all questions to the end of the presentation using the chat window. So, sorry, Dr. Battersby. All right, you're good no, to go. No, no problem. Thank, thanks, Drew. Um, so, so, thank you all for listening in on this talk. Um, Laxmi and I are going to be co-presenting today and talking about a program that we are working on um, called Trellis. And so our presentation is going to be about building a trellis for a more effective and diverse workforce. And we're going to focus on a lot of the issues behind why we are working on this project, how it, how it ended up getting started, and what we're trying to do to try and build this more effective, diverse um, workforce. So before we go too far, I figure we should just explain the name, um, because I get a lot of questions about, well, isn't, isn't a trellis, doesn't trellis have two L's in it? So I wanted to tell you what trellis stands for. Uh, the actual program is Trellis GS, and it uh, stands for Training and Retaining Leaders in STEM Geospatial. So we're, we're focusing on how we can build up the pipeline of women in geospatial and really help keep keep those women in geospatial, develop them into leaders, and create a trellis to give back to the community and to help give other women a leg up um, and help along their career pathway. So the trellis team is led by seven women from academic, industry, and nonprofit segments of geospatial. Um, we're all mid-career to senior in our fields. Um, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who these folks are so that you know, you know what, the, what the leadership is on this program. And, and so you'd have some people to contact if you did want to reach out and talk about potentially how you could be involved in the Trellis program, um, or if you have thoughts and suggestions in terms of how we can help grow and improve what we're doing with the program. So I'm just going to go through these folks real quickly. Um, we have Libby Wentz from Arizona State. She's in the upper left. I'm going to try and go through the photos in order so that, um, so that you can follow who folks are and have a name and face to match up together. So Libby is the Dean of Social Sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a professor at the School of Geographical Science and Urban Planning at Arizona State. Um, her research is really focused on design, implementation, and evaluation of geographic technology and a lot of questions about um, how these technologies can be used for urban environments. 
Um, Somewhat similarly, uh, Laxmi, uh, who is at Hunter College, she is an associate professor of urban planning and policy, so, so playing into that urban environment theme. And her research examines how to use digital technologies such as GIS and how they alter social and political processes, particularly um, how they can create and sustain social change. And she is a past president of the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science. Kate Beard Tisdale, um, she's at the University of Maine in the School of Computing and Information Science. And her research is in modeling, analysis, and visualization of spatial temporal phenomena. Diana Sinton, who is the executive director of the University of Consortium for Geographic Information Science and previously um, a, a faculty member at University of Redlands. Uh, she works with geographic information systems as it's taught and learned in higher education, um, specifically focusing on maps and mapping for spatial literacy. So she's done a ton of work throughout the pipeline, looking at everything from you know, K-12 uh, spatial thinking and literacy all the way up through university level and beyond. Um, Babs Buttonfield, who's a professor at, of geography at um, CU Boulder. She, spoke, she has research focusing on GIS, cartographic generalization, and multi-scale databases. And she's a past president of the American Cartographic Association, um, which had, uh, eventually transitioned into the Cartography and Geographic Information Society. Uh, Karen Kemp is a professor of practice of spatial sciences and teaches spatial analysis and spatial modeling in the University of Southern California GIST programs. And for a long time, um, since the late 1980s, uh, Karen's been a really major figure in the evolution of GIS education in the U.S. and abroad, um, including editing the original NCGIA core curriculum in GIS and editing the uh, GIS and T-body of knowledge with UCGIS. And I'll, I'll just kind of a personal story. She was one of the first people I met when I was a grad student at UC Santa Barbara because she was one of the directors of the NCGIA. And I am a research manager at Tableau Software and was formerly a professor at uh, the University of South Carolina. And I spend a lot of time thinking about how people think about maps. Um, so I'm a cognitive cartographer or a psychogeographer if I want to make it sound really cool. Um, and previously, I was uh, president of the Cartography and Geographic Information Society. So we've got kind of a cool leadership team of women in these mid to senior career areas. And we're really interested in figuring out how we can mentor women up into um, similar leadership positions to give back to the geospatial community. So just a, a bit to start with on why we're working on this project. Um, I think there are some really interesting reports from the Women in the Workplace studies conducted uh, as a partnership between LeanIn.org and McKinsey and & Company that I really recommend taking a look at if you're interested in some of the statistics and findings related to the state of women in corporate America. It's not specific to geospatial, but um, a lot of a lot of the challenges of women in the workplace are really exemplified in uh, geospatial because of the, the pipeline uh, through the STEM uh, process. The short story is that um, we find that there are some really significant challenges that women face in education and in the workforce. And we're trying to help improve the representation of women in geosciences at every level in the pipeline, in academia and outside. So whether we're thinking about you know, K-12, undergraduate, um, graduate, um, faculty, into industry, into government, um, and on. Specifically, we're also trying to help increase visibility and leadership roles. So everything from leadership of research labs to setting up mentoring programs, transition into university-wide administrative leadership roles, and, and so on. And what we're trying to do is help women overcome the challenges they face in order to enhance their careers in geosciences. Um, because the bottom line is really that you know, for, for any number of reasons, women are less likely to be in leadership positions. And that really helps perpetuate a cycle that we think is not particularly good. When you have fewer role models and fewer mentors um, and fewer opportunities to see people that feel more similar to your situation, uh, it directly impacts what any individual considers as success in their career trajectory or what might be possible in their career trajectory. Um, yeah, I saw this directly when I was a university faculty member just thinking about what I could do in terms of this pipeline and seeing that you know, just as being a female in the classroom in a mostly male GI science faculty, 
I had more women in my classes and I had more women that then became majors than any of my male colleagues. And I think that some of that was just because there really was somebody that said, this is really a cool career to be in and look, other women are doing really awesome things in this field. And I think that, I think that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, we really have to tackle you know, these challenges under representation um, because they directly impact attitudes that we see in the classroom and the workplace, um, morale levels, feelings of inclusion, and just feelings of being fully represented as a woman in the geosciences. And I want to point out that um, you know, while we speak generally about challenges for women across geosciences, it's really important to point out um, frequently and loudly that studies repeatedly suggest that these challenges are exacerbated for women of color. So we need to actively be thinking not just about how we, how we improve the pipeline for women as a whole, but, but think about how we address some of these additional challenges um, if we're going to be successful. So specifically in the geospatial with respect to challenges, um, the limited gender diversity in the STEM fields as a whole affects geospatial directly from K-12 all the way through to the PhD level. Um, from our collective experiences on the Trellis team, um, and we have experience across academic industry, um, you know, all sorts of different, different levels, um, we found that women tend to be underrepresented in both areas. And while we find that you know, women in academic geospatial jobs often tend to be visible, because you know, many departments, you know, you're going to find women in geosciences, um, there also tends to be this factor of isolation and with more limited role models in the direct location where you're working. It tends to make it harder to find friendly situations for supportive conversations, as well as talk about challenges that they may be facing when there really aren't people that you feel like are, are on site working with you that, that you can reach out to. Um, you know, for many years, I was the sole woman in GI science in my department. When I started at South Carolina, there were four male faculty members in GI science and, and me. And even though the department as a whole was close to 50-50 in terms of female faculty members, it was still fairly isolating being the only female GI science faculty member. Um, because in terms of being able to discuss my particular career advancement questions and trajectory, concerns that I had about work-life balance and so on, uh, it was, it was difficult to find people that understood what I was facing in geospatial, um, even with just trying to stay up on the technology and keep tabs on everything. Um, I found that it was much easier to find conversations outside of my department, but that was really once or twice a year at conferences. Um, and, and those were the places where I really felt like I was being heard and understood. And so forming that network for support um, really took a lot more effort on my part than it took for my male colleagues who could just walk down the hallway and sit down in another man's office and be able to talk about what they were doing in their field and where they were going with their career and what the options were for them. Um, and I'll say while I had some great male mentors, I've really, um, I've really been able to connect on a different level with the female mentors that I've worked with. Um, so those are some of the obstacles that we're trying to help women overcome in growing their own careers in geospatial. So there are some particular uh, challenges to, to geospatial um, with thinking about mentorship. And one of the big ones is that diversity, uh, or that geospatial isn't really just one thing. I mean, we aren't all geographers. We don't have the same fundamental training or certification. And many of us don't even have job descriptions that sound even remotely the same. So finding the person to talk to is sometimes tricky because you don't know who the other geospatial people are unless you're, you're working with them directly. Um, there's also the challenge that the applications we work on are really all over the map. And I did uh, just have to throw out a map pun there. I really couldn't help myself. Um, so, so one of these challenges of uh, di the fact that the geospatial field as a whole is really diverse is that you find that the people working in geospatial are scattered all over. It's not just geography departments at universities. It might be that there are six GIS courses being taught, but one's in geology, one's in civil engineering, one's in geography. Um, you know, they're really all over the place. And it's, it's, it's often hard to find the people that you can really connect with in terms of, you know, reflecting the core geospatial, uh, of the geospatial na na nature of your work. 
So you've probably all heard or even experienced the problem that it's, it's hard to picture yourself in a situation if you've never seen someone like yourself in that position. So when you're the only geospatial person or one of a very few, it's hard to find the role models to help understand where you can go. So, I mean, I feel like I've been really lucky in my career that I encountered some really amazing people early on and they've served as long-term mentors and I just wanted to throw their photos up just because I want to make sure to give them recognition as this really awesome uh, group of both women and men who have really been great mentors across the field of GI science. Um, so Don Wright, who's the chief scientist at ESRI, Carrie Cron at the Geological Survey, and Sarah Fabricant at the University of Zurich, um, and Lynn Ursery and Mike Finn, who are both at the Geologic Survey as well, and Tim Trainer, who is at the Census, all of them have been people who have been great reaching out across the geospatial field for leadership mentoring. Um, and, and just helping develop the field. And so I wanted to use that as an opportunity to highlight that what we're doing in Trellis is trying to build this network for mentoring and helping women throughout their careers and that this Trellis that needs to be built isn't just women helping women through the discipline, it's building up mentorship networks of women and men who are going to be mentoring um, and giving back to the community. And I think that that's, you know, even though we're focused specifically on issues with mentoring women, um, um, it's really about how we can mentor everybody in the field. We're in a great place with geospatial um, because the field is growing so rapidly. So I think that this is a really great time to be putting extra effort into working hard to help ensure that the field grows diversely. Um, you know, you're probably familiar with a number of these statistics. Um, you know, as a whole, geospatial technologies have been identified by the Department of Labor as a high growth industry. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics has even listed um, or, uh, specific fields like cartography and photogrammetry as much faster than average growth fields with a 19% growth outlook. So that means we're at a great position um, where we need more people and we need to be recruiting and we need to be retaining the people that we have right now. And so, so as we're doing that, thinking really carefully and intentionally about how we can increase diversity is, is something that's very important for us. So why, why we need to be thinking you know, not just about gender diversity, but about diversity as a whole for the discipline um, is because as the field grows, the applications that we're finding for geospatial technology, um, it's a really powerful, really wide ranging uh, set of applications. And the decision making that goes into a lot of what we're doing is complex as we're growing the field and thinking about the implications of the pipeline for future geospatial professionals, we need to be really careful about considering that ethical issues and application of geospatial demand input from a diverse set of knowledgeable individuals um, or else we put ourselves at the risk of making bad decisions or using geospatial technologies in a way that may be um, harming certain populations, that may be oppressing individuals, maybe compromising safety and security of individuals or entire populations. Um, some of the, the interesting stories that you, you, know, you may be familiar with, um, just the, the Strava fitness map um, revealing the locations of secret military bases. You know, it's really great to be able to share this geospatial data, but thinking about how it might eventually be used or what it might be uncovering is something that we have to be really cautious about. I think that there are a lot of times that people don't think in the long range about what the implications of the collection, creation, and uh, processing and sharing of geospatial spatial data might lead to. And so by ensuring that we have a more diverse workforce, we're going to have a lot of new opinions and different opinions that can help think through the ethical challenges that we're going to face as a field. Um, and since I'm talking about ethics, I did want to put out a plug for one of my favorite um, favorite sources of, of resource for this uh, is the GIS, GIS Ethics Project materials that are available from the Penn State e-education program. Um, they provide a great number of case studies to consider ethical problems with geospatial data. Um, and many of these, if not all, as you read through them, um, you can see areas where these problems really are best addressed um, with approaches from multiple, multiple viewpoints, you know, the kind of viewpoints that you're going to find when you have a diverse set of decision makers that are thinking about the implications of the problem. 
So we'll get to, um, you know, what can we do about these broad challenges of diversity in geospatial? Um, so I think we can't solve all of the problems, but we can try to make a difference for women in geosciences. And so what we're trying to do is build this trellis to help um, throughout the pipeline in geospatial. The idea for Trellis came about um, because, you know, there was a group of us that was regularly coming together, often at the UCGIS meetings, and we often found ourselves talking about issues that we were experiencing directly in our departments, issues that we were feel experiencing in terms of thinking about our career paths, um, stories that we've been hearing from other folks in other departments or in government or in industry, and finding that there was a lot of commonality between, uh, between us in terms of the concerns that we had at various stages of our career. And you know, realizing that these experiences we had weren't unique to us, um, and if we were struggling to answer some of the questions that we had about careers and life and just where the geospatial field was going and where we could be going and what our research was doing, um, maybe there were a lot of other people that were, you know, that had these same questions. So strategically, we decided this was a good step for us to take to give back to the field and to take, um, take the experiential evidence that we had and that we had you know, developed just from coming together as, as leaders of Trellis before there was a Trellis um, to lead, uh, you know, about thinking about you know, the value of support networks that we were developing and how we could make these more accessible for other people. Um, thinking about the challenges and opportunities that we were facing and how we could help other people get past them. Um, thinking about the diversity of career trajectories and as we as individuals were doing these transitions in our careers and struggling with who can I really talk with about these transitions. Like when I transitioned from university to industry, there were a lot of concerns running through my head, including whether or not I was about to lose my entire support network because I was no longer going to be at an academic institution and I was going to be in this industry setting which just felt very different. Was I going to isolate myself? Was I going to shoot myself in the foot? What are the pros and cons of this? And there were very few role models that I could find to discuss what these challenges were. Um, so we want to build this pipeline of women to lead and mentor future generations um, of geospatial professionals, primarily in academia, but also in other sectors of geospatial industry, government, nonprofits, for instance. So what we're doing now is we're actively building this trellis. Um, we have funding from NSF to host a series of professional development workshops for women um, in the academic sectors of geospatial science. And uh, while our first cohort is going to focus on women at the mid-career level, we're going to be reaching out to women at varying stages of their career during the life cycle of the project. Um, the workshops are going to be concentrated two to three day activities to bring people together, form a cohort, and to form networks that can support each other and give back to the geospatial community. The workshops are designed to provide a safe space for dialogue and for development of leadership skills, mentoring skills, addressing challenges of work-life balance, and forming strategies for success you know, all the way across the career. Um, and before we t I turn it over to Laxmi to talk in more specifics about workshop activities, I wanted to point out that this really isn't an isolated project. Um, we are absolutely not the only people who are concerned about um, targeting women in geospatial. Um, as you learned, you know, there's some great GITA documents to read, and there are other, many other excellent programs targeting women across geospatial and STEM in general. Uh, for instance, activities by the American Association of Geographers and other professional societies who have outreach activities specifically directed towards women and to growing diversity in the discipline. Um, groups like uh, Supporting Women in Geography or SWIG who have campus groups um, in a number of places around the U.S. and Canada and many more. Um, I know of local meetup groups who actually have a Women in Geospatial that meets um, every once in a while in Seattle. Um, there are companies that are sponsoring activities at their meetings. For instance, at the Esri UC, there are often um, specific women's meetups that are organized. Um, and I think there are a lot of other really great activities, and we're trying to collect what these are so that we can help share them out to the community and help folks understand that there are a lot of resources that they can tap into, but they aren't always um, really front and center to say, hey, look at me and let me help you out. 
So I'm going to turn over to Laxmi at this point uh, to talk a little bit more specifically about the details on what we're doing in the Trellis program. Thank you, Sarah. I am going to request you to advance the slides when I say next. And I want to thank you and everyone else for this opportunity to share some of the information that we've put together for you. Um, Sarah has elegantly set out the what, and as she pointed out, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the nuts and bolts uh, going forward. So uh, one of the first points I wanted to make is that women, when we try to do community building activities, uh, almost by default, we try to do it as a vo volunteer activity or uh, try to do it uh, with um, sort of uh, not seeking resources uh, for external resources to, to account for our time. And one of the things that this group did was to strive to get a little bit of funding so that we could actually adequately support the participants who are coming to these workshops because uh, they are taking time away from their regular schedule in order to, to participate in this professional development activity. So that's an important point to keep in mind that, you know, one has to always seek funding and support to get these projects uh, launched. So this group is meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, as you can see on the screen, and it's being held in conjunction with two uh, other conferences, the UCGIS uh, summer meeting as well as the Autocardo meeting. And the reason for this is so that our colleagues who are coming to think about their own professional development also begin that process of building professional networks by meeting people at these conferences. So we are encouraging them, the participants to stay and, and, and participate in these two conferences. And it's an important piece of building one's own professional network. And I might add that Sarah and I uh, work together on several UCGIS activities and got to know each other over the years because of our engagement in these associations. Next slide, Sarah. So we announced the call um, in early December and we really didn't know what uh, to expect because this was the first time we were launching this activity. And we were overwhelmed by the number of applications and the way the program is set up, we are allowed to, to support uh, 15 participants uh, at this workshop. So even though we did not intend to make this a competitive endeavor, uh, it, it unfortunately became competitive because of the overwhelming number of applications. And as Sarah pointed out, we have decided to focus on mid-career folks for this first round, partly because in in academia in particular, there's a recognition that new scholars coming into the, the stream need support before they, they get tenure or some kind of permanency in their job. And that's, there's a recognition now uh, about this issue, but once people get tenure, they're often left to their own devices and they get lost. So you almost have a, a lost group of uh, mid-career folks who don't move to the, the leadership level. And as Sarah pointed out early on, that's one of the challenges that we actually, we need to build a pipeline, but we also need to have folks in leadership positions. And so that's why we're beginning with uh, mid-career folks with the, the idea that we will expand the, the range in the coming years. So we've uh, sort of made sure that in selecting our participants, we have a diversity of experiences that they can bring to the table. Next. So the workshop themes very closely align with the issues that we have brought up earlier as challenges for women in geospatial. 
and these include uh, communication and language, career trajectories, obstacles and solutions, obstacles and finding solutions, work-life balance, and mentoring and coaching. Now I'm going to go through each of these a little more in detail uh, as we planned the activities in the workshop. Next. Um, before I move to the activities themselves, I, I wanted to give a plug for our keynote speaker. Her name is Dr. Erica Marinskioja, and she studies biogeochemical and ecological effects of landscape disturbance and shifts in biodiversity due to changes in land use and climate. But more importantly for us, and our uh, reason for bringing her on as a keynote, is that she is very very active in issues dealing with issues of diversity and inclusion. And she is the lead PI of, an, of, a, of a grant that is developing bystander intervention and ethics training to address sexual harassment in the geosciences. And she is committed to increasing the participation of historically underrepresented groups in science. And she is active in a group called the Earth Science Women's Network. And so for all these reasons, we thought that Erica would be a wonderful person to kick us off in our uh, reflections in May. Next. So now we get into the nitty gritty. So uh, the first theme that we're going to try to cover is communication and language. As most of us know, uh, communication, especially professional communication, is very culturally contextualized. Context matters. What is acceptable in one place is not necessarily acceptable elsewhere. We also want to point out that communication is interactive. So women encounter awkward and and sometimes worse communication from a range of actors in in professional settings. In our academic setting in particular, the communication can be awkward with students, peers, and supervisors. And part of the challenges that were alluded to before about women feeling invisible in, in the workplace means that some women tend to also communicate using different types of language. For example, women are more likely to use language in professional settings um, that sound like, I feel that, or I'm not an expert, but, and these types of communication patterns have the potential to cause serious harms to them and to to the rest of the women in the workplace. So part of what we're trying to do at the workshop is really to prepare participants to reflect on their own communication style, to recognize the words and grammar that may weaken professional communication and effective communication and help them think about strategies to become better communicators and also also consider the importance and value of listening and listening carefully. So next slide, please. The, the next point theme that we want to cover is career trajectories. Uh, as Sarah uh, had pointed out, it's quite difficult for women in the workplace to identify potential career pathways and recognize how their skills and interests can be aligned with these career pathways because this requires exposure to meeting people who have already shaped their careers to draw inspiration and to get advice. And so part of what we'll do in the workshop is A, to get participants to articulate their own career trajectories, actually to plan their careers, and then to begin to to ask what are the barriers that are holding you from achieving those career trajectories. So for example, many mid-career women talk about not being invited to participate in leadership roles, uh, either because they are not viewed as leaders in their uh, community or because they are very busy 
doing activities that does not allow them to shine in leadership roles. And so part of planning career trajectories is also to prepare participants to have difficult conversations, to identify mentors, to, to, to uh, know how to ask the appropriate questions with one's leadership team in, in the place of work to d evaluate what are the existing guidelines or requirements for career advancement. Next. This is something that uh, we all recognize intuitively. There, in any workplace, there's great potential for, for conflict. Um, the conflict may be interpersonal, but very often there are very structural problems that create conflicts. So, for example, in our business, um, the, we treat adjunct faculty differently from non-tenure track faculty and from tenure track faculty and then moving on up the chain. Now, those are sometimes the problems that can be ameliorated uh, through policy, but someone has to engage with this issue carefully. Um, so the interesting thing is in our business in academia, what others may think as very trivial, like course scheduling, a request for flex time, or request for a course to teach, can cause conflicts. Um, so when women feel invisible, then they also start to feel like they aren't sure whether there's a real conflict or there's a potential happening, or if there's a real problem or whether it's an issue of perception. And so part of what we want to do in this workshop is to, to, to learn to practice how to engage in in serious conversations that have potential to cause conflict, but to de-escalate and mediate before it gets out of hand. And for that, you need to have already built in some support networks you can go to to talk about strategies to move forward. Next. Work-life balance is something that is important to to all of us, and for women in particular, uh, there is a, a, a well-acknowledged uh, reality that women tend to overcommit themselves and take on more uh, things than they can, partly because it has to be done and someone's got to do it, uh, but they also take on difficult work. They take on work that can be emotionally challenging and and more troubling, they take on work that becomes invisible to their supervisors who, who have potential to reward them. In academia, for example, these include things like um, working with students who have um, learning difficulties or challenges of other other challenges or providing the informal support that's needed by just being there to listen. So for example, in my department, I happen to be the only woman of color, which means then I get to hear a wide range of issues faced by many women of color, and some of it may not be directly related to geospatial, but it definitely takes a good amount of my time to navigate and help them navigate their lives as students. And I see that as my responsibility, but it still takes time. Um, women also tend to have household obligations that require a lot of juggling because they are, are addressing the needs of different members of their household. And therefore, we want to make sure that in this workshop that the participants start start to use to make their own time use diary and understand how they're using their time. Because often you'll find women in the workplace say, oh, um, 
I do this, but that's not really work. But that that is work, whatever they're doing, whether it's talking to people or giving advice or organizing an outreach activity or working with a professional organization or, um, you know, volunteering their time in in some community development effort. And so this is really important in this arena to engage uh, participants to think critically about how they're using their time. Next slide. And last but not the least is the value of mentoring and coaching. Um, we do have uh, some mentors, some female mentors in the geosciences, but and we have a few role models, but for most of us, we rely on women within geospatial, outside geospatial, as well as some wonderful men who are supportive and are serving as allies. And it, this slide, these images are by way of lifting up these these people. Um, the first slide on the t the first image on the top is the late uh, Dr. Carolyn Mary, uh, who is an amazing mentor to many of us. The the image below that is Dr. Sona Andrews, who is a geographer and uh, a provost at Portland State University. And then you find Dr. Lynn Ursery, uh, who's at USGIS, Dr. Tim Nyerges, who's at the University of Washington, and Dr. John Wilson, who's at the University of Southern California. These are but a few of the mentors who've helped me as an individual grow in my professional life. And we wanted to, I wanted to make sure like Sarah, to acknowledge them here. So in this workshop, we want to point out to our participants that we all need mentoring and coaching, and we need to learn how to offer mentoring and support. And this is not a sort of a one, one way that I need mentoring. It's also how can I be uh, an effective mentor? So to begin that conversation. Next slide, please. So to summarize, we have two and a half days to work with our participants. And this is the beginning. And so we have decided that our workshop activities will be interactive and reflective. Um, so it's really learning about oneself, learning by doing, sharing information in different ways, and having the opportunity to be a teacher and a learner at the same time, right? Or to, to navigate back and forth between those roles. Um, so we want to make sure that it's inclusive and non-hierarchical because clearly the seven of us, we don't have all the answers. We've got the conversation started. We've created the space. We've created a safe space. And we want to make sure that the conversations flourish within. And so it's about self-awareness but other awareness, understanding dynamics, and to begin to prepare the next generation of mentors. And, and from a sort of academic or professional perspective, it's also important for us to begin to gather data so that we won't be in a situation where we just don't have information, good information about about mentoring and challenges for women in geospatial. Next. We expect to produce materials that can be shared, videos, podcasts, uh, and at this juncture, I want to ask the audience to please, please share with us your recommendations for good resources that we can share to a wider community. They may be examples of best practices. They may be articles, uh, videos, podcasts. Please send them to us. And we are compiling a list and we'll be happy to share out our resources through, through GITA, through other organizations to ensure that we disseminate information widely. And the real goal is to develop strategies to improve the work experiences and the 
the professional experiences of women in their geospatial science careers, wherever they may be, not just in academia. Next. We are hopeful and, well, I should say modeling what I said earlier, we are confident that uh, our, our work will, will create uh, benefits such as creating this academic support network across disciplines and also to, to address the professional development needs, not only now but as in the future because we really want to understand how, what the needs are now and what the needs will be. And we also want to prepare women to be good advocates for themselves, which means to cultivate those self-advocacy skills and also to recognize that career pathways are, are complex and to reiterate the value of the trellis and the recognition that for women, it's not a ladder, but it's a trellis. And so the next slide, please. So here's how you can be involved. You can volunteer to serve as a mentor or a, a speaker at a future event. You can help by distributing our surveys and our resources. You can apply to participate in our workshops and you can also begin to think about how we can identify similar projects across sectors so that we can work in partnership together and not see it in, in silos. And last slide, please. So this is our website. Um, this is the, it's hosted at UCGIS. Our contact information appears, and I believe that we have reached the end of our formal presentation, and we are ready to begin a conversation. Thank you. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, that's perfect. Lexman, Lexman, thank, you thank you so much. So that was much. great information. Great. Um, I've got some questions about the workshop. Have you scheduled the next workshop? And if so, do you have an idea where you're considering having a workshop? And, I'm, and that's assuming these workshops are in-person workshops, correct? Uh, yes, these workshops are in-person workshops, and we, that's because there's great value in actually taking time to get to know people and to listen and learn. We have not yet scheduled the workshop for next year. We have informally been speaking about the benefits of co-locating with an on ongoing conference because we really want to engage uh, our participants to to not only engage with each other within the workshop but to connect with other colleagues who are coming to a conference. So that's where the conversation stands right now, Drew. Wonderful. Well, if there's anything we can do at GIT to, at GITA to help with that conversation or help identify some some solutions, please let me know. I, I really like the information that you're providing. I think there's great value here. And it couldn't come at a better time when we're looking at an aging workforce that, you're right, is predominantly full of men that over the next few years here relatively shortly will be retiring or, you know, just kind of getting out of GIS. So we'll need to fill those positions. And if we can fill those with, with strong women who can become tomorrow's leaders, I think that's great. Thank you. We have a question on how we on how um on how viewers that were watching this can submit their interest to uh, participate. Uh, the question is to apply to participate in a future workshop. I think so. It just says it just says how can we submit our interest to be a participant. So I'm thinking that's really friend, Sarah and I. Um, Sarah and me this e an email and we will connect you um, as appropriate um, because the, the current workshop has been scheduled and the participants have been selected. 
that's coming up in, in May, but the next workshop is not until next year. And so in the meantime, we can begin a dialogue about um, how to direct inquiries. Okay. And I'll just, just chime in. For this year's selection process, I believe we put out, started putting out the call for applications um, in December or maybe early January. And so it would probably be a similar time frame for 2019, um, assuming that we co-locate with, um, you know, a springtime conference, which seems to be seems to be a nice time on calendars. But again, we will we will be sending out the information about the 2019 workshop and application material and scattering that as widely as possible because we really do want to focus on getting a good, interesting cross section of women to participate that can help form these really diverse networks to to support each other. Excellent. Can you go through a quick rundown of what that what that application process looks like? for someone that's interested in participating in a workshop? Yes, um, we we try to make it um, simple, but at the same time reflective. So we basically asked participants to share, um, we post some questions for them about what, what positives uh, are happening uh, positive experiences they can report on in their current workplace and to also discuss some of the challenges they're experiencing. And we asked them to speak about how they thought they could participate in the workshop, like what could they contribute, what, what, what are they needing, what are they seeking to get. And that's what we we got people to to say to us in a sort of an essay format, and uh, we made our decisions based on the responses. Um, Sarah, do you want to add? Yeah, I'll I'll just add. Um, yeah, with the application process, it was. I mean, we had a lot more applications than we had, had thought that we would get. And, and from reading the stories where women were really reflecting about where they were in their careers, where they were trying to go, what some of the obstacles were that they had been facing, and what they were looking forward to in terms of their career trajectory and the support that level that they had currently, the limitations that they were seeing, and what they wanted to do with the knowledge that they were going to obtain from participating in the Trellis program. Program. Um, it was really, it was really a great way, um, at least for for me, to understand more of these challenges and the similarities that that people are facing across their careers. And so, seeing this reflection um, is really an important part of the application process because it helps us put together this cohort of people that are really going to to be able to maximize the benefit of a group coming together to learn together and support each other and help um, help with outreach after the Trellis workshop. Very good. Is there a listserv or a newsletter that, that people can join to, to to keep up with what's going on with Trellis? I don't think we've set up a listserv yet, um, but the UCGIS uh, website and this website, uh, people should plan to check that um, to look at updates. And uh, we are certainly happy to, to, to be the conduit to link folks with information if people can just talk to us. Okay, perfect. So it seems like the website's kind of the place to go, but people can also reach out to, to you and Sarah directly as well. Yes. Okay. We have a we have a question related to um, the participants that are involved. It says most of the information that they've seen is in relationship to to academia. Are you looking to incorporate any non academics into the program? And I don't know if that's from the participant side or the speaker side. Just it seems like what the person was reading said that most of it was kind of focused around women in academia. Are you also focusing on women that are in non-academia or in public or private sector as well? 
I, I think it's a bit of a complex answer because I think we need to understand, like we're, we're certainly wor open to working with women outside of academia, but we have to explore uh, how they may link up with academics or if there's a possibility of a linkage uh, in terms of career trajectories or experiences. We certainly welcome people to um, express interest and to begin that conversation. I think it's not, we're not trying to be exclusionary. Okay. Yeah, and, and I'll just, just ch chime in that, that early on in the process, um, what we're trying to do is focus our efforts on developing specific cohorts. Um, so we decided um, in part, you know, because we wanted to, just to, to start by building a strong initial cohort of mid-career women, that by, by focusing on academics at first, we would uh, be able to build up a cohort of people who are all in more similar situations, even though some of those women may be thinking about transitions out of academia or into, you know, non-traditional academic, you know, faculty type roles. We wanted to, to start Trellis off by, by forming those cohorts of more similar um, people in more similar career states, but we have discussed amongst ourselves in the leadership of Trellis quite a lot about how how the the academic community isn't necessarily the only community in geospatial that needs to be addressed, and right. have been thinking about you know how in the long run this could be extended out beyond just the academic community. Um, you know, I for instance, I made the the change from academic into industry, and and I see a lot of similar issues to what I experienced as a faculty member um, in industry. And we approach the problems in different ways, but there still is a challenge in terms of mentorship and leadership and, you know, thinking about all of the same struggles that, that we see in academia. So I'm, I'm hoping that we will be extending it out in the long run. Right. Now, for, for students that, that may be online listening right now who are current PhD students or current graduate students, what's your suggestion to them on, on getting involved with diversity in the workplace and kind of women in GIS, either locally or with Trellis? I, mean, I, th I think there are a lot of really great programs. I mean, definitely following the Trellis um, website and as we look at future cohorts, I think we will be looking at earlier in career individuals. So this year is mid-career focus, but we had a lot of really strong, really interesting um, applications from current PhD students and we struggled quite a bit with, you know, how do we, how do we form this, this ideal first cohort, um, especially because we see so much need from the student population population as well as through mid-career and even senior career for a lot of folks. Um, so keep an eye on the, the Trellis program and our calls for participants in future years, but also thinking about some of these other resources that are being put together, like the Women in GIS organization has some really great um, opportunities to connect with other women in the field. Um, American Association of Geographers has a number of great, um, great opportunities at their conference, as well as resources that they provide through their website. Um, outside of geography specifically, there are a lot of women in STEM organizations as well, um, or uh, the Society of Women Engineers. There are a number of different um, places to start looking for resources, but they may not be as tailored to geospatial as, as the Trellis program. Right. Are, are, are there any plans for Trellis to have a presence at any of the trade shows like the Esri UC or any of the other geospatial conferences that happen around the country? I think that we have talked about it, but we are also mindful of um, resources and time taken uh, to do this. And so we haven't sort of formalized it. Many of us are at uh, some of these industry events, right? Not all of us, but um, we, so short answer is, we haven't made a plan yet, so we're building the ship as we're trying to to navigate here. So we we haven't finalized some of those things. Well, yeah, please. So, I mean, in, initially, I think it will be um, when we happen to have co-location, there will be informal gatherings of right. past cohort members and people who are who are interested in, in joining us. And that would be something that you could you could get in touch with us if you're going to a a big uh, geospatial 
get together um, the AAG conference, the Esri user conference, and we could let you know if any of our leadership group is going to be there and, you know, maybe try and get together at least informally. Oh, that would be perfect. Well, I'm very excited about this. Is Please keep, keep me and keep GITA informed with what you're doing as you move forward. If there's anything that we can do to, to, to maybe help you out or even possibly do a, um, a co a co presentation of some sort, um, please let me know and I'll definitely I'll definitely put that higher up. It's just cool. Well, we appreciate it and we actually are so glad that uh, GITA um, sponsored this webinar and invited us uh, to make a presentation. I think it's it's a beginning of a good um, sort of professional connection with our association. I think so too. And again, Lakshmi and Sarah, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to have this conversation with us. And for all of you that, that tuned in to listen to this, thank you. We really appreciate your participation. And yeah, please, you, Lakshmi, Sarah, is it okay for people to reach out to you directly if they have you know, more specific questions about Trellis or some broader questions about how they can participate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. With that, we've, 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 we've hit an hour perfectly. So, um, again, thank you, everybody, for participating. And please, please pay attention to what Trellis is doing. I think this is really important for our industry. Thanks, everyone. All right. Everyone have a good day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.